but the Garoa and to the neighbor.
said and done, you got the, the amount of jobs in the area. Uh,
have a seat. I'd like to call this meeting to order. If everyone can have a seat, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Trade, Commerce, and Technology Committee. Uh, I am joined by my, my colleagues, Councilman Buscaiano, Councilman Bonin, uh, Councilman Gregorian, Councilwoman Martinez. Uh, we've got a, a full agenda. We're going to try to get through a number of items uh, and then take number item one last so we get through the, the shorter items first. Um, to start out, Mr. Espinosa, are there any general public comment cards? We don't have any public comments, sir. Okay, so general public comment uh, is closed. Now, unless there is an objection, what I'd like to do, well, actually, let's take up item two, which I was intending on taking up on consent. Mr. Bonin, you have a uh, request that we add into that an LAD, LADOT report back in 30 days with possible locations near the new taxi holding lot where t taxis can park when awaiting uh, pink dispatches and minimize disruption. Is that correct? You want us to add that in? Uh, yeah, just so LA, LAWA and DOT understand what I'm talking about. Uh, currently under the existing lot, there is an area nearby where um, code pink taxi dispatches, supplemental taxis that get called in when there's a high demand, uh, wait. And it's not near residential areas. I want to make sure that they are establishing a proper standby area for the code pink dispatches that are not in the central business district or in nearby neighborhoods. So if they could report back with that in 30 days, LAWA and DOT jointly. Okay. Move as amended. Great. So uh, it's been moved as amended, approved uh, by unanimous consent. Great. So that item is approved. And now, uh, colleagues, I'd like to move items three through seven also on consent. Move the items. Second. I items have been moved and seconded, approved on consent. Uh, now we have I'm going to take up items eight, nine, and ten, and then we're going to come back to item one. So, uh, Mr. Espinosa, could you please read item number eight? Yes, Mr. Chair. Item number eight is an information technology agency report on the measures that may be taken to address the issue of inappropriate graphic images on uh, social media. Great. And are there any cards on this item? None, sir. No cards. Uh, and I don't know if Mark Wolf or Mike Dundas or City Attorney's Office, uh, please join us and mm -hmm. go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Ito with the Information Technology Agency. And the report before you is a collaboration between ITA and the City Attorney's Office to address this motion asking for uh, methods that the city might take to address inappropriate or graphic images on social media. The City Attorney has advised that the, the city is limited in its ability to direct social media sites to take down images, but we can certainly work with them and encourage them to develop policies and procedures that will uh, affect that, uh, that result. The City Attorney actually researched the terms of use for the five most significant social media sites. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Vine, and Snapchat in the areas of uh, responsibility for content and graphic content, and this, there's a summary of those terms of use in the report. Of course, the enforcement of those terms is voluntary and up to the social media sites. Generally, these policies don't censor images posted by the users, uh, although they may list um, situations um, under which they would uh, they would take down images um, as a, or as list reasons why they would remove content. In some cases, that prohibition relates to the specific uh, location of the image posted. For example, if it's the user image um, prof or profile picture, they might be more inclined to ask uh, the image to be removed. Twitter, however, recently um, adopted a policy that is specific to the situation, addressing the, uh, the um, situation of an image of a deceased individual where the removal of such an image is um, at the request of the deceased family. And we really believe that that uh, policy is a good model for the city to request other social media sites to adopt. And that would be our recommendation that this committee and council instruct ITA and the city attorney to contact the social media sites and request adoption of a similar policy regarding removal of, the, of an image if it is at the request of the deceased family. 
Um, we further would request approval to work with the social media sites on a process by which the city might contact um, social media sites and request an expedited review of, the, of images that would uh, the public has asked to be taken down and to get a feedback loop so that we know um, that the review has been had, has been done and we get some feedback as to whether the image will be removed. The city would only intervene in those situations at the request of a constituent um, who has come to the city and asked for and has already made their own attempts to have the images removed and has been unsuccessful. We believe that these two um, efforts, the policy change and establishing a process by which the city might um, act on behalf of a constituent is a good policy and a good way to address the appearance of graphic or inappropriate images on social media. And we thank um, Councilmember Harris Dawson and Councilmember Blumenfield for their leadership in this area. And I'm happy to take any questions. Appreciate it. I think these are good suggestions. Are, are, there, um, are there any state or federal laws that prohibit some of these images? I mean, obviously you can't show someone, like a snuff film where someone's being killed, but there is a, a place, you know, you, here you have a, the image that sparked this controversy is, is mm -hmm. a criminal situation where someone is being shot, potentially killed. Where is that line in, legally where an image cannot be shown? And I'll defer to the city attorney to address. Sure. Uh, Mike Dunn, the city attorney's office. The, the, the line is, is basically drawn uh, in the First Amendment jurisprudence. I mean, it's the, the distinction between something that may be uncomfortable versus something that's obscene. Um, the, the example that um, we've been giving, it would be sort of in, in context, which is the, the there's very little that the city can do in terms of legislation. In fact, there's nothing really the city can do in terms of legislation to force these companies to take their take content down if it doesn't uh, if it's not something that they already doesn't meet the obscenity standards under the First Amendment case law. Um, the what the companies have already done is drawn very close or bright lines with respect to their terms of use, and they're very carefully protect images that may be graphic and offensive but are not. Uh, obscene in that, for example, somebody may take a picture of a dead body on the street and be gloating about the fact that, let's say, it's one rival gang versus another rival gang. That's maybe something that violates the terms of use and that Facebook may require that post to be taken down, but legally it could still be a proper form of speech under the First Amendment. Um, the ones that they try to protect, the, the companies try to protect more often is not, is, for example, the news photo that went around um, regarding the, uh, a lot of the photos and the images that you saw with the uh, um, the Syrian immigration into Europe, some of the images of the of, of people, like the, the child on the beach, that's something that was posted on Facebook often and something that Facebook actually encourages because there's a political message behind it that people want to see action. While it may be offensive to some people, it's something that is protected under the First Amendment. So in that sense, what the report states is that there's little that the city can legally do to compel these things, but we can work with them to try and set up a process so the company can understand the, the, the feeling the family has with respect to the image that's posted about their dead family member. So, and that, what happened as the, with respect to Twitter was when Robin Williams had passed away, you know, had lost his life, um, a lot of people were posting at his daughter offensive images dead of the picture of Robin Williams had been photoshopped onto like a mortician's table. And that's what resulted in Twitter's change of policy because of the bombardment of images to her account. And so that's something that we would encourage other companies to approach as well as that similar type of policy. Members, any additional questions? Mr. Corian. So uh, first, I really wholly agree with um, the intention behind this and, and that council, uh, the council members have, have tried to pursue uh, with this. Um, the, the concern I have, I guess, is, is the very lack of ability that the city has to do anything with this because of the First Amendment. And um, while I think that these recommendations, especially just reaching out and asking for voluntary uh, changes in, in policy that will help to address some of the destruction of civility and you know, basic humanity that social media has brought in so many uh, different ways, the concern I have is that if we start going down this path, we may create an impression on the part of the public that the city may have some role in this. 
And just to be clear, the city has zero role in this. The city has no ability to control this. Um, we're going to be devoting ITA resources and city attorney resources to respond to these things. And people are going to expect results when, in fact, we can't deliver any results. All we can do is plead in the same way that individual members of the public can plead, um, that someday, somehow, uh, people will come to their senses and start bringing basic humanity back to social media. Um, so, I, I mean, these are good suggestions as far as they go. I would just be really cautious about trying, uh, about anything that would create that public perception that we have the ability to act on this, because we do not. So, if, maybe, I mean, the, the recommendations that are contained in the, the requesting voluntary processes and engaging to request voluntary adoptions of policy similar to that of Twitter. That's fine as far as it goes. Um, but I think when we communicate about this, we need to be very clear with the public that that's as far as it goes. And we're really just trying to be, um, trying to encourage good citizenship by the social network companies and, and we really don't have any other tools available to us. So. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts in that regard, but I, I, I really don't want to be misleading to the public by suggesting that we can do anything, because they're going to expect that. Right. And the absolutely. next time we have this horrible situation come come up, they're going to expect the council or the city to be able to fix it, and we can't fix it. Um, and we, we start down a terrible slippery slope when we start talking about, um, you know, obvious situations like somebody who's a, a, a just just been killed and those images are put up on social network but at the same time many members of the public will feel that particularly if it involves the city in some way a police involved shooting or something else that that's very much in the public's interest to see and so where does the city come in in trying to decide what is appropriate what's offensive what's in the public interest what's not I sure don't want us to be in that position Right, and and we would only be doing this at the request of the family of the deceased. It's a it's a limited policy to address their grief and their anguish at, at seeing photos that are disturbing to them. Um, so, ITA and the city attorney would be trying to use the weight of the city um, to impress on the social media sites that it's in their interest to be proactively good social citizens and to take down and to have a policy about removing those images if it's yeah. at the request of the family and to work with us on a process to do so. I totally agree with that objective. I just want to make sure we're clear with the public that, that right. that's as far that as we can really go. Absolutely. Yeah, with that, Mr. Wolf, did you want to add something? Uh, good afternoon, Mark Wolf, Executive Officer with ITA. Councilman Krikorian, to your point, um, although it's under very different circumstances, we have set up similar types of relationships with other private sector firms for, and dealt with public communication on those matters. Uh, to give you an example, um, although again, very different circumstances, under the cable television franchise, when it moved from a local franchise that the city controlled to the state, we lost direct control over customer service um, to have the authority that we previously had. At that time, when it changed over to the state, Time Warner was a very good business partner, uh, community partner, and they volunteered to set up a escalated path for communication for escalated complaints where we let the public know we had no direct authority over requiring Time Warner to help them out with an escalated issue, but Time Warner provided us at least a phone number that we could direct those uh, citizen requests to them. So it's kind of the same thing. We'll ensure that between working with city attorney closely on this that we'll have whatever communication we have, whether it's on the website through through elected offices and, and through our department that we'll make sure that it's completely understood that this is just a voluntary process that the, that the business uh, partners have with us. Great. Thank you. Great. So without, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, without any other objection, I think it's a good path to move and I would uh, move that we approve the ITA recommendations. Seeing no objection, uh, that'll be the order. Thank you very much. That was number eight, and now we'll move to 
Uh, number nine, Villanueva. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> my notes say uh, someone's here, but you must be filling in, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, would you please read item number nine? Certainly, sir. Uh, item number nine is a CAO report relative to innovation fund funding and implementation steps for the Bureau of Street Services smartphone dispatch of pothole trucks. We do not have any cards on the side. No cards. And we have a uh, Swan from the CAO's office. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Bianca Swan, a project coordinator for the Innovation and Performance Commission. Uh, the Bureau of Street Services has provided the requested itemized budget for its innovation fund submission, smartphone dispatch of pothole trucks. CAO and the Innovation and Performance Commission has reviewed the itemized budget and transmitted it to your committee for approval. I'm happy to take any questions you might have in regards to it. Right. Now, we heard this item last time at yes. the September TCT. I asked the CAO and street services to identify the, the best available rates for purchasing of the smartphones and cost-efficient data, and most importantly, to provide us with an actual itemized budget. Yes. And, and I very much appreciate that you guys have provided that. Um, Mr. Spots, if you, if you wanted to say anything or if there's anyone from street services wanted to add anything, but I think this is a good item. Um, so it's... Any other questions from members on this item? Great idea. It's a great idea, and, and I appreciate you filling out the, the doing the extra work, and, and, and I understand you had a productive meeting yeah. with ITA to get some of those uh, details worked out, so it's great. And uh, without objection, I'd like to move this item. Seeing no objection, we'll move forward with this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, would you read item number 10, please? Yes, sir. Item number 10 is a Los Angeles 2020 Commission report relative to establishing a regional tourism authority. We do not have any card on this item, sir. Great. We have inviting uh, Bud Overham of the Convention Center and uh, Patty McGen McGenet of the LA Tourism Board to the table. Um, thank you both for joining us today. Um, you know, this item, just to, to remind folks, the 2020 Commission made a number of recommendations about um, how we could improve. Um, this one to me stood out as, as really one of the few that was actually actionable, where we could actually do something about it. Um, and so I was excited, you know, I, I love the, a lot of the, the, the movement of the 2020 report, but I was excited when I took over uh, as chair of this committee to, um, to be able to do something about one of those items which I think could really help us with, with jobs and with moving forward and trying to improve our economy. Uh, so, I invited you both to, to come here and give us a little background about what your organizations are already doing uh, for regional tourism and, and a little bit about how you think um, we could actually make something like what was proposed in the 2020 report, a regional authority, uh, a reality. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm Bud Overham, Executive Director of your Convention and Tourism Development Department, uh, and I'll, I'll start, and Patty will uh, very ably fa uh, follow up. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us here. This is a topic that, that also interests us, obviously, is, is the new department that you all created to promote conventions and tourism. Uh, uh, the idea of regional collaboration, cooperation, is, is very appealing to us. Um, not in the way of excuses, uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense that you know, this department has been in existence for two years. Last calendar year, we were very consumed about farmer's field and football, and this calendar year, we've been very consumed about what we're going to do with that farmer's field and football. Uh, uh, but the idea of working together with the other cities in the county uh, uh, has, has been very uh, intriguing to us. Uh, I do think that it, it's, the timing is perfect, that your committee has taken up the interest, we have the interest. Patty and I spoke to the county local government services commission uh, about a month ago, August. about August. exactly in August. My time flies. Uh, about exactly the same thing. Uh, so yes, we're very enthusiastic about the opportunities. We're very enthusiastic about uh, working with this committee. Uh, a couple of things that I would want to mention in, in the in the spirit of of Mr. Kikorian in terms of lowering expectations so we don't think that we're going to tomorrow go out and form a regional authority. Uh, the, the reality is there is still a lot of competition within the cities, within the county. The way the local government tax structure works, the TOT goes to the city where the hotel is, the sales tax goes to the city where the hotel is, or the, the store is, and so the, 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 the structure of local government finance 
breeds competition more than it breeds collaboration. But our feeling is that we can take an approach of the further something is away, the easier it is to do collaboration. When the National Ch Chiropractic Association has made their decision that they're coming to Southern California in 2022, we want them, Long Beach wants them, Santa Monica wants them, everybody wants them, and the, and the hunt's on. But when you're thinking about Philadelphia, just recently had a papal visit, you're thinking about getting the Pope to come to your city, you're thinking about the, the, the Democratic National Convention or maybe the Republican National Convention or the Final Four or any of those really big events that you're planning far ahead of time, then all of us have the opportunity to work on that together because we will all reap the benefit when it comes to town. When, when, when the Pope went to Philadelphia, everybody within a couple hundred miles economically benefited from that. So that's where we see the opportunity is, and that's the pitch that Patty and I made to the county is identifying those things that are so big of such regional benefit that we have become natural allies rather than competitors. So that's one thing we want to we want to try to embark on. We'd love to work with your committee. The other thing, and I mentioned this the last time I was uh, before your committee, you know, I'm fascinated coming from the development business where we talk about uh, transitory development. I'm really fascinated by the concept of transitory tourism. And in the report that I gave you on page 12 and 13, I just look at the metro system system and how the metro system ties the whole city together and to think that we can have a convention here uh, up at uh, state doing something at the convention center but jump uh, on the red line and go up to Harry Potter or that we can have a family staring at Universal Studios and and, and take come down on the, the, the red line and transfer and go to Exposition Park and see the space shuttle you know that the, the transportation is and, and, and I mentioned uh, only city examples because I'd much rather have them go to San Pedro than go to That's to than go to Long Beach. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there are times when you know these other cities when people think about the beach they don't realize it's in Santa Monica it's the beach. Whoa you know? whoa whoa! <laughs> Venice. I'm in Venice. That's what I'm saying. I walk a thin line here. I walk a thin line. Patty did not bring you. <laughs> So, so you understand the point of regionalism, that there are times when we're competitors, there are times when we're uh, uh, complementary. Uh, so we want to work with your committee, and we have a lot of sensitivities here to work with your committees to, to, to work on that. The other thing we want to work with, and it's particularly appropriate to your committee, is technology. The way you're going to be at Harry Potter and figure out how to go see the space shuttle is you're going to go here. You're not, we're not going to have a docent passing out maps. You're going to, you're going to go here and you're going to figure out how to do it. So the idea of regionalism, transit, uh, transit transportation, tourism, technology. It's a natural fit. We're happy to, to work with your committee going forward in the future. That's my thoughts on it. Patty, of course, is, is uh, uh, from our wonderful LA uh, Convention and Tourism uh, Board, and she can speak about it from her perspective. Well, I agree with everything what Bud said, except for the Santa Monica. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's an kidding. example. <laughs> um, we're actually very lucky here in Los Angeles because we do have an awful lot of stakeholders, a lot of partners that are helping us promote Los Angeles. Certainly at the federal level, there is Brand USA. Visit California, which is the state level organization, has just doubled their budget from 50 million to 100 million, and they're very focused on, on the Los Angeles area. We work very closely with LAWA, um, and we also work uh, closely with the port on a less formal basis. And then I think you're all aware that the Tourism Marketing District um, was formed a couple years ago. We just renewed it, um, and that is quite a bit of um, funding for us. That also lends to some of the challenges that by was mentioning in terms of the fact that um, municipalities are very it's very prescribed in terms of how we spend our funding um, but the lens even though we have our city hat on most of the time we do have to as a marketing organization look at the lens that our visitors are looking through um, so we are uh, fortunate and in front of you is a very brief um, couple of uh, slides, and we're not going to go through them all because I know you guys are really constrained for time at the moment, but it does give you a sense of some of the other um, what's called destination marketing organizations or CVBs that we do work with here in the area. And when we work with them, it's a pay-to-play cooperative so that we're not spending the city money. They are participating. We all either pool in-kind services or um, financial, financial uh, commitment to it. And there's a number of programs, as Bud was saying, the further away we are, 
internationally, it's very easy to work together. Um, when we get closer in market, it becomes a lot more competitive, particularly on the sales side, where the um, I think there's a lot more we can do on the marketing side together. Um, I don't want to necessarily go through all that now, but we work with them on a year-round basis, whether we're looking at um, doing media site visits or we're doing fam tours um, for the travel industry. They work and bring um, resources to the table as well that we're doing that. Um, we just went to China for a sales mission. Um, we invited Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, West Hollywood to go with us as well. Again, they're paying a premium to be able to participate. So there's a number of examples like that. Bud mentioned the um, transit-oriented tourism. We have just started working with the um, Los Angeles County uh, Arts Commission and Metro on a program that will roll out in phases to try and get us to this direction where he sees. Um, so there's a lot of that more we'd like to share with you, and maybe at a time when there's you have a little more time, um, we can go through that. But the, the good news is that there's a lot of collaboration now happening. Um, we can always do more. And so I think it's philosophically everybody's on the same page. You know, it's logistically how does that, how do we make that happen? So, and, and how do you, how would you think would be the best way to fund such a thing? You know, if, if you're going to talk about the bigger, longer term items, create more of a regional board that will be a supplement and complement to, to the work that you're doing. Um, you know, we're the 800-pound gorilla as the big city in the group, but how do we, how do we create a, uh, a reality that's, that's a shared mission? When we went to speak to the county uh, uh, government services commission, we told them that they were the big 800-pound gorilla and that they ought to pay for it. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think we can expect uh, some help from the county, and the, because the county is an umbrella that over is is over all of the cities, but it will take a lot of outreach from all of you, from us, almost on an individual basis to to help people see the shared vision, and that therefore it's a, a shared. Way. Most of of the other cities, like us, get their money for tourism from the transient occupancy tax, TOT, transient occupancy tax, and. For us, is one of the fastest growing revenues in the general fund. For all of these cities, it's one of the fastest growing revenues in the general fund. So you have an opportunity to take one of your your, your fastest growing revenues and look to that as a way to to fund it. And, and, and let me say, and I know you're tight on time, but I really do strongly believe that tourism and conventions are, are, are the purest forms of economic development. I spent my whole career working on taking auto dealerships from one city to another tip, taking a retailer from one city to another city. That's good for budget development. It's not necessarily economic development. Tourism is pure economic development. You're taking teachers, lawyers, engineers, accountants, widget makers from all over the nation. You're flying them into the city. They stay here for four, five, six, seven days. They spend a lot of money, and then they fly home before they need police, fire, paramedic services. So it is, it is one of the best forms of economic development that any city can undertake. And so I think we can impress upon all of these cities why it's to our advantage economically to work together. There'll be more money for all of us. It's not a zero-sum game. Yep. Just... Oh, thank you. Thank you for your report. I want to... Other than my misstep, yes, sir. It's okay. We still love you. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to coin that phrase. Tourism is, in its purest form, economic development. Tourism convention is pure economic development. Um, in, in, in time where we're trying to redevelop the waterfront, the LA waterfront, I don't see a drive in bringing um, convention and hotel space down to the waterline. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, we have both our CAO and CLA here, time where we're trying to redevelop the waterfront. Can, can you project, and we have our labor partners here, great opportunity to build a nice convention and, and hotel space along the LA waterfront. Give me your thoughts on that, bud. Well, you know, and, and you and I have talked about this before. I am such a, a, a wild supporter of the port. You know, I'm a, a Navy brat raised in ports all over the United States. The only thing I know is ports. We are the only city that I can think of that hasn't maximized its water frontage like everybody else. Right, uh, right. You know, growing up in San Diego, Baltimore, I know what those ports were like before and I know what they're like today. So 
I think that it's it, it's an it's a tremendous underutilized. Just like the convention center is an underutilized asset, I think the waterfront's an underutilized asset. A lot of work to do uh, because there's got to be a there there. There's got to be something that attracts right. people to be there. Uh, we've talked about some ideas uh, of, of more visitor convention activity down there. I used to be city manager of Downey. I know that that area is so underserved by a capital in, in one sense, and I think yeah. there is some, some regional opportunities there, too. So I think there's great potential, yeah. but it's going to take a lot of work. I, I personally... Uh, my, my main goal is to take all the conventions away from Long Beach. That's great. And, that's, and if you look at... I know we're looking at a partner, <laughs> countywide partner. Later. However, but... Um, <laughs> Um, we are in a position where, you know, we're searching for this economic development um, for the San Peter Wilmington areas and, and having this public access to the water line for everyone statewide would be an incredible asset. The port has done incredible work thus far in moving on the infrastructure improvements, the Cabrillo Way, Cabrillo Marina Way, the uh, looking at Outer Harbor. We're very close to solidifying a lease agreement from what, I'm under from what I understand with um, the developers for the, um, the ports of call development, and that's going to spark um, some more interest from the development community. As I, I've said before, um, I want the official bird um, in my district to be the crane. Um, and that's with economic development, hotel, retail, commercial, um, convention space, where it's just right for it. You know, and as you, as you mentioned, Baltimore, some of these ports already have a downtown built in their waterfront, and I'm willing and able I um, want to create our own downtown um, down in the San Pedro area. And I just need you to help, along with my colleagues, you know, this is, I've been laser focused on this the last uh, three years in office, and I'm happy to call the Port of LA a partner in, in supporting our goals in reimagining and, and redeveloping the, the LA waterfront. You know, I, I share that, and the one you didn't mention, or maybe you didn't, uh, bigger, but the cruise, I, I really believe that there's the opportunity for a cruise terminal when, when we were working on trying to get Disney to home port there. The idea was. We were competing with uh, with Long Beach, Anaheim, and San Pedro to be the home port for Disney in, in, in San Pedro One, and then all the violence in Mexico basically evaporated the the, tour, the market for that. Uh, but Disney got into it on a land sea kind of basis that you can have a Disney cruise that does the Mex Mexican Riviera, and then go to Anaheim for Disneyland, and so you can package that the way they do with their cruises in Orlando and going into the Caribbean. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity. In that, and I and I always, I guess, maybe going back to my Navy roots, I think the cruise terminal is a is an opportunity for growth. Also, would you um, support having a satellite convention um, space down at the waterfront? Yes, I, you know, we have we have nothing to fear from a, of a convention center that that is sized properly it, it, to serve its area. Uh, our our convention center is a million. Well, under the uh, remodeling, be a million two hundred thousand yeah. feet. The 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 it's not in the spirit of regional cooperation, but the the the, the target that you're after, frankly, is Long Beach. Long Beach right. is 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 well positioned. They're big enough. They're bigger than the rest of the stuff in that area. They're bigger than Downey and everybody else. But they don't try to compete with Anaheim and San Diego and us. Uh, so they've carved out that niche. That's the niche that, yeah. that we'd really want to carve out. And their convention, isn't, convention center is not on the water. No, it's well, not on the water. have that walk across the bridge to get there, but right. it's not on the water. And, and, it's, and it's a lot smaller than us. I mean, that's so... You know, we don't even list, when you go through this book, we don't even list Long Beach as a competitor because they're not after the national conventions that, that we're after. Uh, we compete on some occasions. So I definitely think there's a complementary role to be played right. Looking with the right-sized facility yeah, in that area. That. And I would just echo what Bud's saying, though I wouldn't underestimate the um, value of the leisure traveler also. Um, we've been working with the uh, San Pedro area for many years, and there's more synergy down there now than there's ever been. So... And I know Thursday we have a um, we have a mixer with our local chamber and, um, and and your folks as well, Patty. So thank you for that. Yep, uh, this Thursday on the Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Patty. Uh, Bud, less less critical. <laughs> Just to, to start off, um, in addition to Cabrillo Beach and San Pedro and Venice Beach, there's also Dockweiler Beach and Playa del Rey, and there's Will Rogers Beach in Pacific Palisades. There is a rumor that somewhere between Venice and Pacific Palisades, there's a Ferris wheel of some sort, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> Never seen it. Uh, 
I'm very intrigued by this idea, and I think that there's uh, some potential benefit for it because I think inadvertently anyway, we spend a lot of our money and the other cities benefit. Um, it, when we promote Venice Beach, there's only one or two hotels in Venice, and so folks stay in Santa Monica or an unincorporated marina, and other jurisdictions get the, the TOT from that. So I can certainly see the benefit of bringing everybody together. The, the thing I want to, to be careful about is uh, I don't know if in, um, any of my colleagues see the same dynamic. I think Mr. Buscaino probably does with, with Long Beach, Mr. Krikorian may with Burbank, is um, the small cities that surround me are smart and strategic and very wily. And uh, you, I'm sure, Bud, have seen it on economic development, is they can focus more laser-like on economic development in Santa Monica than we ever do in Venice, because we're just more mm -hmm. spread out. And as we figure out how we might do a governance structure on this, there's always going to be one person in Santa Monica whose sole job is going to be fighting to make sure Santa Monica is represented well in the marketing and the advertising. And I'm concerned that there's never going to be one person who's thinking just about Venice. There'll be one person who's thinking about Venice and San Pedro and all over, and they're not going to know the right pressure points to make sure that while we're spending probably 50% of the money, we get 50% of the, the marketing. And so it's just something, I don't think there's, a, there's an answer to say, but I want that to be something we think about as we figure out how to construct a, a regional authority. But I do want to just comment on that because that does go right to the heart of some of the challenge of this because of the tourism marketing districts in particular as well as the TOT. So we heard you loud and clear on that. Thank you. It's great that two of you happen to be on this committee. Yes. <laughs> no accident. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the challenge is obviously growing the pie. It's not, you know, once you start splitting right. up the pie, then that's where things fall apart or as things get closer. But we all know that if we can grow this pie, that benefits L.A. and everyone else. Uh, any other questions, colleagues? No. I mean, so what I'm going to recommend, although we have a public comment card before we officially take an action, is, uh, is to ask you to come back uh, 60 days with a with a written report about how you think um, we could actually do this. So, to, you know, you, you, some of the best minds right right in front of us here about this kind of thing, and how how could we get the ball rolling, and whether that's making a plea to the county and what a structure might look like, um, or what have you. We're kind of giving you. You've heard some of our concerns. You, you've read the 2020 report. It's really to to give you a free hand to try to to come back with some, some ideas so that we can move this idea of growing the pie forward and creating some sort of a, of a regional authority. So thank you very much thank you. for your time. We have one. Mr. Chairman? Yes. If I can, I know on the 17th we're going to have a special TCT um, committee meeting in the, at the Port of Los Angeles. I'd love to even invite um, at least Patty to, um, of course, Bud, you're more than welcome as well to give us um, your ideas and take on um, you know, the future of the LA waterfront. As, mm -hmm. as it relates to convention and hotel space. So I'd love to see you on the 17th, same time, but at the we, we need to talk about that and, and get something on the agenda for right. a motion, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that offline and figure out a way to, to make something like that happen. So thank you Great. both very much. Um, Ms. Ruth Sarnoff, come forward for comment on this item. My name is Ruth Sarnoff. Um, I attended probably uh, more uh, 2020 commission meetings than any public uh, person without uh, a uh, something to some special reason for being there, just a member of the public. Um, what has gotten me about uh, what you're discussing today is I think we're becoming a, a, a tale of two cities here in terms of... Um, the gentrification of large sections of our city and the poverty and lack of housing um, and homelessness that is the other side of the coin. Uh, people are being spilled out as a result of new uh, high rises coming in and there is a, a great deal of concern about things like water security uh, the condition of air. We have some of the worst air, in fact, the worst air in the country. And the corridor from the harbor to uh, San Bernardino, 
which takes in a lot of poor communities down the Alameda, uh, Alameda Street and down Atlantic. Uh, we have lots of small communities that are suffering a lot from this. Um, I think the uh, some reevaluation in light of climate change and the kinds of ice things like the ice storms and the uh, fires that are now uncontrollable. You've got a lot of things on your plate, and be careful what you ask for and what you push so hard for. The downtown news had 90 projects unrolling within the next three, four years, and there is parking in all of those, or the ones that said anything about parking, and many didn't, but of the about 4% that, that reported, they were putting a lot of parking in those projects. So think about what you're asking for. Thank you very much. And I want to put this, these articles in a, a record, if I might. Bill and Webb will take them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, as discussed, without objection, the instruction will be to instruct the convention center with the assistance of the LA Tourism Board to report back in 60 days, uh, to provide a written report back in 60 days, establishing uh, about the ideas of establishing a regional tourism authority. Seeing no objection, that will be the order. And now we'll move to item number one. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, would you please read item number one? Certainly, sir. Item number one is a motion by Council Members Blumenfield and Wesson relative to the proposed transfer of ownership of LA Ontario International Airport from the City of Los Angeles to the Ontario International Airport Authority. The committee shall recess to closed session pursuant to Government Code 54956.9D1 to concur with its legal counsel relative to the case entitled City of Ontario versus City of Los Angeles et al. Riverside Superior Court case number RIC 1306498. This matter arises from operation of the Ontario Airport. We have uh, four speaker cards on this right, side. And, and we're not, before we go into open into closed session, we're going to actually first ask uh, the, our labor folks who were uh, on, the, on the agenda to come forward for a 10-minute presentation. Uh, we'll have some questions with them. Then we're going to ask the Lawa folks to come forward uh, after that in open session to speak for a little bit. And then we're going to move to closed session where uh, Lawa will talk um, uh, in closed session the types of things that we cannot discuss in open session. So we have uh, various representatives from labor. I have some public comment cards from, from some of the same folks who are making the presentation. Just, just for the record, since you're formally on the, okay. the uh, agenda, you don't need to have your public comment card because you're going to be given this, this time to speak Thank now. You. Uh, and if that's okay with all three of you who have public comment, I'm going to start with um, Ms. Pree. And, and you, can, you can choose the order of your folks, and we have a... a 10-minute presentation, and then we'll have Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, we have speakers um, from a number of affected unions uh, who um, represent employees at the Ontario Airport. Um, there are concerns from our brothers in the private sector. Um, we're going to lead off a presentation of those issues um, by Gabriella, who is here to speak on behalf of Rusty Hicks. Um, you're going to hear from our private sector brothers in um, the building trades, in the IAM, um, and in Teamsters 911. Um, then we're going to move to um, a discussion of some of the issues pertaining to the transfer as it relates to um, the direct employees of the Ontario Airport. Good afternoon. My name is Gabrielle Landeros. I'm the press secretary for the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. Today I'm here to provide a brief statement on behalf of the Federation's Executive Secretary Treasurer, Rusty Hicks. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, the Los Angeles County Federation stands in strong support of the hardworking men and women and the local unions that represent them at Los Angeles World Airports and Ontario Airport. Today, Ontario Airport is a union facility where employees have a collective voice on the job. As such, we seek to ensure that it remain a union facility and that employees who work there continue to enjoy the terms and conditions under which they currently work. In addition to direct employees, Mayor Garcetti's commitment in the settlement agreement letter of intent and the settlement term sheet calls for the inclusion of all employees at Ontario Airport, even those with private employers not directly employed by the City of Los Angeles. The City has historically taken great care to pass policies and ensure workers are protected at LAWA. 
These policies are critical to preserve in any transition of employees. They include the following, Certified Service Provider Program, Labor Harmony, Service Contract Worker Retention Ordinance, Living Wage Ordinance, Project Labor Agreements on any construction. The Federation and its member unions have worked with both governmental and private employees, employers to better the lives of working people in Los Angeles County and with its sister labor federations in surrounding counties. Therefore, we urge the City of Los Angeles to work with all parties to honor the letter and intent of Mayor Garcetti's commitment to protect all employees serving at Ontario Airport throughout the upcoming transition. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Fernandez. I uh, represent employees at the Ontario Airport. I uh, work with the IAM as a union representative. And I'm here today um, to speak to you guys in regards to the issues that we have, uh, not only at the Ontario Airport, but also at the Los Angeles Airport. But my concern today is that by LAWA going away from the Ontario Airport, we wonder what's going to happen to our members there. The living wage ordinance has, you know, and we're glad we got the living wage ordinance in place right now because thanks to that, our members are able to make a good living to take, you know, to our families out there. However, what's going to happen once the LAWA goes away from, from the Ontario airport? Are we going to have the same type of policies from our guys? I mean, I'm concerned if the retention policy is still going to be in place. As you guys know, every three years or every four years, that companies have to redo the bids to try to keep their business in place. And there's companies that are underbidding these companies without the retention policy. New companies coming in, are they going to be able to keep our members working at the same locations? Or are they just going to be terminating people left and right? So today here, I'm delegating for all our brothers and sisters that works at the Ontario Airport and asking you guys to please do something about the policies, try to keep them in place so that we can protect our workers and our members there. We got over 2,500 uh, members at the Ontario Airport and that's for each member that we got there, there's a family that will be affected without these policies. So I'm here today just to request for you guys to do something about it and consider the fact that with all our work, we need to somehow work on the policies that will protect our workers in there. Thank you, guys. Hello, my name is uh, Jesus Luis Raya. I'm also a representative for the uh, International Association of Machinists. And I'm here to express my concerns and show support for LAWA. I just want to start by saying that without LAWA, there will be no regulatory body to enforce the policies that are beneficial to the airport's employees. It is hard enough to represent our members at companies like Swissport, who even with LAWA in effect, have tried to take advantage of their employees. If LAWA goes away, there's no telling what these companies might do. There's no way that they would continue to abide by the LWO without anybody regulating a fair wage for the airport's employees. Employees have enough of a hard time to make ends meet, and if LAWA goes away, you can just imagine what the result will be. At companies like ABM, which we represent at the Ontario International Airport, the employees and their families will be negatively affected. These employees and their families live within the city of Ontario, making it an issue for the community as a whole. The entire, the entire Ontario community will be taking a hit. Therefore, we urge you to please reconsider your position on this matter and work on the policies under LAWA that are favorable to our members and, our, and all our airport employees at Ontario International. Please be aware that there are 2,500 employees who are counting on you to make the right decision. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Carlos Rubio. I am a business agent for Teamsters Local 911. Uh, not only representing Teamsters uh, here uh, this day, but we're also a, uh, a member union of the Coalition of City Unions. In the city of Los Angeles, we represent MOU 34, uh, which is composed by all of the uh, crossing guards in the city. Uh, for this conversation, however, uh, our local is the uh, largest parking local uh, in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County. We represent over 3,500 parking attendants. We've been doing this since 1975. And what I could tell you is that part of the reason why I'm here is to support our brothers and sisters, all the families uh, that are have something to do with the Ontario Airport. And the reason is, is because every single union that you see represented here plays a key role not only uh, as employees of LAWA, 
and the LA City family, but also through your contracting services, through pu uh, public-private partnerships, which are, will also play a key role uh, in city operations. For example, in Ontario Airport, Teamsters Local 911 represents uh, approximately 100 employees, yet we have one of the largest contracts in the city, which is the parking, uh, uh, the parking contract. Similarly, in LAX, we represent perhaps one of the largest contracts, which is the parking contract. Parking is a revenue generation uh, component of this operation. It's not only an important component, but a very lucrative component. And it's important that you understand that we're part of the conversation. It's important that you understand that we will stand you know, next to these brothers and sisters to ensure that all the terms and conditions that we outline and have outlined and have we submitted this in this letter um, that, you know, that we pay attention to. Uh, we understand um, this is, uh, it involves more than just a union component, but it's important that you consider that we're part of the conversation. Thank you. Before we go to questions. So um, let me say um, how appreciative we are um, that this committee is weighing in um, on these very significant issues that we believe to this date have not been given due consideration in the discussions of the transfer of the Ontario Airport from Lawa um, to the Ontario Authority. Um, specifically, um, we are asking um, that before any transfer occur, that there be full discussion um, with the authorities in Ontario to resolve each and every one of the issues that have been articulated as it re relates to our brothers and sisters in the private sector unions, as well as the specific issues that are enumerated uh, in the letter that we have provided to you today. Um, relating to um, the current employees of Lawa assigned to Ontario Airport. Uh, it, is, it is critical that these issues be resolved. Um, we have looked at the settlement, uh, the sort of um, moving papers thus far. There is effectively a section uh, that has no content as it relates to the labor issues. These issues are complex. They are significant and clearly need to be resolved before the transfer is effectuated. And so that I would ask today um, that you outreach uh, and direct that all of the labor issues be, um, be f fully discussed, be fully um, sort of, that we be fully engaged um, with discussions with the City of Ontario, with the representatives of the authority, um, and that we work to resolution, um, and that we report back to you um, the status of these before there be any further movement um, on, the, um, uh, on the transfer. Um, now I wanted to turn to Ellen Greenstone, our legal, oh, I'm sorry, Dave Sanders. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. I'm at the table. I just want to at least introduce myself. So David Sanders, SCI Local 721. And we represent about 100 people, employees at Law, at law in Ontario, I'm, I'm sorry, in particular. Uh, vital employees, security officers, maintenance personnel. We understand what the contractual obligations are for those city employees, but we also want to make sure that with, the, with this letter and with the, the, the uh, people at the table that you know, before the I's get dotted and the T's crossed, that, that we just do it right. And, and those issues and items we have that need to be mitigated further than what, what we believe has done thus far, has been happening thus far, we want to make sure it gets done before, before the contract is signed. That's the that's only role we have here. That's the only role I have here. I just want to make sure it gets done right. And I appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Uh, I spoke the last time about the importance of... Uh, having a fair and level playing field between LAX and Ontario. I just want to comment that uh, we have uh, airport officials in the room. They recognize the partnership that we have with the building, tr they have, they've had with the building trades. We've done billions of dollars worth of work that you folks have voted on. Been, we've been very successful at LAX with the work and we want to make sure that uh, Councilman Buscaino's uh, city bird flies at Ontario under the PLA. We want, to see, we want to see him share the crane across the city and other regions. I was on the 2020 Commission, and uh, even though they didn't adopt a lot of the stuff we suggested, 
we ruffled a lot of feathers and we got uh, people thinking. You know, when we suggested that they merge the two ports, I've, I got an iPhone and I've never seen it smoke, but the phone burnt up. But we got people thinking, and there are ways that uh, two cities can work together on items to make, to make the region competitive. We have big enemies to the south, we have big enemies to the north as far as the ports, and one down in the Gulf. If we don't get competitive together, we're going to lose uh, the economy here as far as the ports. So that's what we did with the 2020 Commission. We ruffled a few feathers and got people thinking and talking. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll okay. move to questions. Any additional presentation comments? Or we'll move to questions. Did okay. Um, I think Ellen, we wanted to just, yeah, Ellen. Our attorney, Ellen Greenstone. Hello again, thank you. I just wanted to emphasize the, the concerns we have about the timetable. Uh, there have been, there's a preliminary settlement agreement with settlement terms that uh, commit to uh, an agreement concerning the continued employment of the employees at Ontario Airport. Um, that's being finalized in a longer form the actual transfer won't occur for some time because the FAA needs to approve. And waiting until that point is a problem. The time is now, we believe, to resolve the terms uh, as they apply to the employees. Everybody needs to plan. Everybody needs to know what their options are and where they're going to be. And, and many of the employees who currently work for the city of LA um, at Ontario Airport live out there. They have families. It's an area that's important to them. And it's important to them that the terms and conditions continue. Uh, that discussion needs to take place now. Uh, otherwise, it won't take place at all. Um, so we, CAO Miguel Santana has been helpful in connecting me with counsel for LAWA in the litigation. Uh, I hope quickly to engage with the other counsel uh, to the litigation and see if we cannot participate meaningfully in the settlement discussions as they go on to a final long-form agreement as it concerns the, the term that deals with the employees. We don't have any desire to impede uh, the progress of the settlement, but we do feel that the term affecting the employees needs to ma be made more specific and um, our involvement in those settlement discussions is critical. Thank you. Okay, well, I appreciate that and we certainly want, we're glad that you're engaged in the discussion and, and obviously any, any deal ultimately has to come through um, you know, this, this council. At the moment it's proposals and, and great discussions that our mayor's doing a, a fabulous job of, of, of pushing the envelope and moving things forward, but at the end of the day, we have a, an obligation as a council to review all the terms and conditions and, and to move forward. Um, since our last meeting, um, we talked about making sure that, that this city is responsive, and I know that you've had several meetings. Do you feel like the city is being responsive in terms of the communicating uh, with labor since, since our last meeting? Well, we were... Um we were asked to provide um, a, a list of specific concerns, um, and that was provided in a meeting on October 13th. Um, quite honestly, um, the city's response to, to the list of concerns was that they needed to, to secure direction from this committee. Um, and so we are asking um, that you give strong and clear direction um, to, to city negotiators, to um, the the legal team uh, that's been that is working on this case, that the labor issues need to be seriously addressed and specifically tied down. Uh, any argument that these issues are not ripe until after the FAA has, you know, blessed the deal is simply not appropriate. Um, this is the time that all of these issues need to be resolved. And again, I want to emphasize that it's it's issues. Um, that affect the direct employees of uh, Ontario, LAWA, 
uh, and also all of the private sector um, employees um, at LAWA, who in, excuse me, at, the, at Ontario, who uh, enjoy um, the fruits of policies that have been enacted by this council uh, that direct uh, labor conditions. And so all of those things need to be given due consideration and weight. And again, the time is now. Um, so we're asking for a very strong and specific direction um, from this committee um, to, again, all, um, all affected uh, city officials who are engaged in this deal to, to negotiate um, specifically and reach agreement on, again, all of the issues that we've articulated today and are contained within our letter. I think at our last meeting we expressed that desire, and I think we're going to express that desire again as a, as a committee, but I'll move to my colleagues for questions, additional questions. <coughs> Great. Well, your presentation was uh, just fun. Just so the, I think the lack of questions means that we agree with Mr. Blumenfield and we will be uh, affirming that direction, not that we're disinterested in what you're saying. <laughs> no, we understand that you're moving into executive session, and we... Uh, we are hopeful, again, that you give very clear and strong direction on these matters so that we can engage in the kinds of uh, discussions that need to take place prior to the transfer. Sure. And, and we're going to do some of that in open session um, next, but we wanted to, uh, as we discussed in the last meeting, give you a chance to, to provide the overview at, uh, first in terms of the labor issues. Obviously, our discussion uh, with the Lawa folks is going to be both about the labor issues and the general, uh, the financial terms of the overall uh, deal and how that's going to work and the, and the particulars. Um, but this has been, I think, a very important discussion. I want to thank you all for coming out uh, and, again, reiterate from, from my perspective uh, that these are really important issues that we need to get resolved, uh, that, the, that labor folks here need to meet with the city folks in Ontario, uh, and that needs to happen right away. Um, has that been happening yet? Is there something that we can do here to help I mean, besides expressing our strong desire uh, as folks who have to vote on this ultimately, uh, but to help make sure that, that the necessary meetings between our labor uh, partners and the Ontario folks are happening. What, I, what a, I think that it would be very helpful if you would direct that that outreach happen and that the city um, facilitate those discussions um, so that they can happen soon, immediately. Um, and that we can be in a reporting relationship to this committee. I think that that's really uh, important that we, you know, that those discussions take place, but that we can also have an opportunity to report um, the outcome of those discussions here to help shape your decision making about uh, the ultimate uh, deal. Yeah, we would certainly like a report back on that. Um, so let me ask that formally on behalf of the, the committee uh, as, we, as we take this up next to get that uh, report back from you all on how those discussions are going. Excellent. Thank you. Great. So. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, Thanks. So next, we're going to hear from uh, Lawa folks. I believe uh, we have the general manager, Ms. Flint, uh, the airport department, Steve Martin, and uh, other folks are here. And we'll, uh, we'd like to have uh, as much of a discussion as we can in open session uh, with, the, with the clear understanding that not, not all items can be discussed in open session. Um, but We'd like to get as, as much of the discussion out in public as we can legally with the city attorney's watchful eye, making sure that we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't step over the line in, in, in any way. Obviously, a lot of this has already been very public in the news and press releases and everything else. So there's a fair amount that can be done in the public, but we want to be respectful and clear on not stepping over the line in terms of that goes. So I, I give the floor to you. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the committee. Um, certainly, these uh, the issues that you have in front of you and this topic of discussion is one that resonates very deeply. Um, I know that from the direction of the Board of Airport Commissioners, also from the, uh, the mayor uh, in the LOI, uh, and certainly from the team at LAWA. These are our employees. We understand the importance of uh, the transparency and the continuity, and we worked very hard uh, to assure of that. Uh, 
Thank you for acknowledging the fact that this is still ongoing uh, settlement discussions and litigation, uh, and so we must be very careful about uh, keeping in the public eye and talking about these matters with that framework. Uh, what we do think would be helpful is to go through the chronography uh, of what, or chronology rather, of uh, what has transpired to date, uh, and then certainly in closed session uh, apprise the TCT of uh, the details of why we are uh, where we are uh, with the uh, settlement negotiations. Um, I'm Steve Martin. I'm Chief Operating Officer um, at LAWA. I'll just give you a background of the timeline for the events leading up to the letter of intent and other things related to it. Just as background, the, the question always comes up, and just to clarify, why does the City of Los Angeles own an airport in a different county and in a different city? The answer to that is, in part, there was a joint powers agreement, which is a very important agreement and as part of the whole contextual uh, issues related to the airport, a joint powers agreement between the City of Ontario and the City of Los Angeles that was from 1967. The property actually transferred in 1985 from the City of Ontario to the City of Los Angeles. We first heard of the City of Ontario's concerns about the airport in December 2010 when Gina Marie Lindsay was approached by a representative of Ontario about, uh, about a series of concerns they had on the airport. The first thing we did following that, we actually issued a, a request for expressions of interest. Um, since the City of Ontario, the other party to the Joint Powers Agreement, was dissatisfied with our operating the airport, we explored the idea of having the airport run under a contract with a third party, but under the City of Los Angeles rules. Um, that was rejected um, because the, most of the people who would be interested in doing that really believe that the Joint Powers Agreement was a complicated legal uh, burden on the airport and nobody believed a deal could be closed. Um, in December of 2011, we got a, a formal letter from the City of Ontario representatives proposing that we transfer the airport to uh, the newly created Ontario International Airport Authority, not back to the City of Ontario. Um, we probably spent more than a year in supervised mediation with Miguel Santana carrying most of the burden as the neutral party trying to find a way that we could arrive at a transfer under terms that were mutually beneficial. Um, that led to two things that the Board of Airport Commissioners did. One, the Board of Air Com Airport Commissioners in um, December of 2012 adopted principles uh, that would govern the transfer. That was done in public session by the Board. Uh, it covered a lot of issues, including employee protection. And employee protection has been in everything that we've produced along the way. Um, and in January 2013, as a result of the sessions that were set up by Miguel Santana, we actually produced an offer letter where we would offer to sell the airport to the City of Ontario under terms that we included in that letter. Um, City of Ontario rejected that. And that's when litigation started. So right after that letter to transfer was offered, um, the litigation started, and from then it's a it's a story for the city uh, attorney to sort of engage in. But it has been a a process that started a long time ago, actively in terms of concern about the effectiveness of the Joint Powers Agreement in December 2010. And each year we seem to make very little progress on this. Additional discussion before we go to questions. Well, I guess maybe the, maybe the city attorney wants to. We we were in um, mediation, court ordered mediation for. Yeah, know, John Tavitz in the city attorney's office. Yeah. The uh, at the start of the mediation, the court ordered that any discussion be confidential and the parties not share it with the public. So we are still under that court order. We returned to the mediator on November nine. Return on November ninth. Ninth. Yes, November ninth. And is that? Is that a date for? It's a return date for the mediator to see if the settlement has been finalized or where we are at the status of the settlement. Wasn't there like a 60-day clock of some sort that was going from? Yeah, the the, um, the letter of intent that is dated um, July 20th, July 30th, um, between the mayor of Los Angeles and Mayor Pro Tem of uh, Ontario established a 60-day clock when, by which we would have reached the long-form settle, settlement agreement that the woman on the prior panel referred to. 
that 60-day clock was designed to be completed before this November 9th return date to the mediator. So that's coming up very soon. I think that's already come and gone. The 60 days. Has. Yeah. So, so we're beyond the 60 days that the letter of intent expressed a desire to have finished. But to uh, be clear, the, it's not a court-imposed 60 yeah. days. It, yeah. The court-imposed deadline is November 9th to yeah. return for a discussion with the judge. So for, for some, the, the final details are supposed to be worked out by November 9th at least to go before a mediator. Is that correct? Either worked out or explanation to the judge of where we are, what the status is. And then at that point it would go, if there was agreement um, by both sides, or bo both of the negotiators, it would then have to go back to both cities, City of LA, Council, and Ontario. Is that correct? I don't think the court's commented on that, but uh, yes. Well, the, once, the, once it doesn't we, have to go to, to BOAC and the council before November 9th, does it? it has to, that has to be after. Not necessarily. If the parties have reached an agreement, the court would just get a report we've reached an agreement. Right, but the agreement is not binding until um, it's approved by the, the, the two cities. Is that that's, not correct? That's right. That's correct. Okay. So is there, is there actually a thought that this would get done through the city before November 9th? I this is the first I've so. heard that. I, I don't think so. Okay. All right. So we have we have those issues. We have some of the financial issues, and and while they're all fresh in our mind, we have some of the labor issues that were just discussed in the previous panel. And I, I'd like for you all to address some of some of those issues. And and certainly, you know, we we take very seriously the the idea that we want to we want to carve some space and direct the negotiations so that. Our labor partners can go to the Ontario folks and and have those discussions that need to happen before this November 9th. So my question is, what do you what do you think of what was in the letter, and what can we do uh, on our end to help uh, facilitate those discussions happening on the Ontario end? Sam Samangistu, Deputy Executive Director, um, the letter and and the set of uh, requests or, or, or demands uh, by labor that, that Ms. Parisi talked about on October 13th. Uh, we have reviewed that. We have made that available to, to the City of Ontario. Um, uh, they have responded um, uh, in that uh, all... Uh, we would like to discuss their response in closed session since we are under court order regarding any kind of settlement negotiations are confidential. Okay, so without, without talking about the details of the response, I guess the question is um, how, if at all, can we help um, facilitate those discussions so that um, our, our allies and friends in labor who we've worked with for all these years can have the ear of the Ontario folks, and the Ontario folks will know that it's important to us and that it's something that they've, they have to listen to because we're... we're ultimately the ones who have to sign the deal at the end of the day. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Miguel Santana, CAO. Um, I, I have spoken with representatives of Ontario and they have agreed uh, to meet with the members of labor that, that were presented today and um, I offer to help facilitate that meeting as soon as possible. So we will be doing that. Um, there are a number of issues as has been discussed and again we recommend that those items be discussed in closed session. Uh, question, you may want to answer this in closed session too, but I feel like I need to ask it here and then city attorney will opine uh, either way. Um, I received a letter the other day from the Alliance for Regional Solution to Airport Congestion, RSAC, uh, which is very supportive of the sale, uh, has been more aggressively supportive of it than, than I've been. I've been a little on the fence about it. Um, in their letter, they point out that the 2005 stipulated uh, settlement agreement, 2005 or 2006, uh, which Ray and Sampson will remember. I think we may be three of the only people left in the city who were part of it. Uh, required Lawa to maintain uh, operation and control of Ontario and Palmdale airports uh, for at least the length of the stipulated settlement agreement. Um, and they contend that we can't make this transfer uh, unless the stipulated settlement agreement 
is amended. Now, they're willing to consent to that, but obviously they want some concessions and changes to their benefit in the stipulated settlement agreement. Has anybody at Lawa or City Attorney's Office reviewed the stipulated settlement agreement to make sure that we're even authorized to proceed? Uh, yes, yeah, Suzanne Tracy from my division, uh, Ray Lagunas, Managing Assistant at the airport, uh, City Attorney's Office. Uh, Suzanne Tracy has reviewed and I believe has responded in writing. I've not seen that writing, but uh, yes, we believe we, are, we may move forward. Okay, I haven't seen that. If I could see a, a, a copy of that. And do you uh, have any understanding of, sh she's saying that the stipulated settlement agreement doesn't require Lawa to maintain control, or do we have a difference of opinion on what constitutes control? I'll have to, uh, I think we, it's something for a closed session. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, just, I want to give any additional opportunities if there's open session questions. One other open session potential question, because um, this has been in the news a lot, Ontario uh, agreed to take on Lawa employees, according to the newspapers, um, who want to stay at Ontario for at least a year. Um, did we, is this, has it been public if, if they want to stay, if after a year they don't find it a fit, is that something that we're saying they would be able to come back to LA, or is that something we can discuss? I, I don't know. There's been a lot in the paper, so I don't know what's. Uh, public and what's not. Yeah, we, we ought to discuss that in closed okay. session as well since it's part of the settlement uh, negotiations. Okay. Okay. It's, it's, it's a tricky conversation because there's been so much in the press, but it's hard to know what's what's public and what's not public. So we'll we'll move to uh, the closed session uh, at this point. Um, again, uh, but uh, but in, in open session, I want to reiterate that that it is that desire of the committee to try to facilitate those discussions with labor uh, as, as much as possible and to make that happen expeditiously because November 9th is around the corner uh, and so we really want to make sure that, that we're doing everything in our power to, to, uh, to make that happen. So thank you for that and we will now, um, Mr. Villanueva, if you would take us into closed session. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, before we go to closed session, we do have one public comment card which we have to take. Uh, prior to that, and that's uh, Ms. Ruth Sarnoff. So if Ms. Sarnoff could come forward and then uh, give your public comment, and then we will move to open to closed session. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Sarnoff, uh, it's been my observation that the airport uh, commission and harbor and and the Department of Water and Power uh, function as pretty semi-autonomous uh, uh, bodies and interact with councils and other things in mysterious ways to much of the public. Um, it occurs to me that Ontario is not just going to be uh, a very busy international airport, but it is also a city and it has people in it who have to breathe who uh, have to uh, travel and who have uh, want clean air. And I don't know how this airport uh, figures in to the new uh, uh, big warehouse. Uh, I don't know what to call it. It's certainly not one building, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be equivalent to 700 um, football fields. It's the biggest probably anywhere in, in one location in the world. And where are the trucks from that going to go? Uh, and where are things being loaded from that? And does it mean uh, a lot of truck traffic coming in to Ontario? The 10 and the 60 uh, are corridors which are facing a lot of air pollution, as is, is all of a, a lot of parts of San Bernardino County. And I don't even know where Ontario is in my mind right now. I'm getting old. <laughs> and, and a lot of things uh, I just can't remember. Uh, and, and I wasn't expecting this to be talked about today, but I'm glad it is. Um, I would ask a few questions. Um, I had signed up for public comment, and I see my time's running out. Please uh, go slow on this and take, uh, take a moment to uh, absorb the magnitude we're living in a time of climate change and there's a lot of you. things you got to think about not just one thing compartmentalized Appreciate thank you that. thank you very much 
Mr. Villanueva, would you please uh, take us into closed session and we'll also need to turn off the, the sound. Okay, the, uh, the committee is now going to closed session pursuant to government code section 5.956.9D1 to confer with legal counsel relative to the case entitled City of Ontario versus City of Los Angeles et al. Riverside Superior Court case number RIC 1306498. This matter arises from the operation of the Ontario Airport.